very pleased today to welcome Professor Robert Wood, now of uh, Harvard University. He's uh, one, of his, one of our own, having completed his uh, PhD here in 2004, working on the uh, Micromechanical Flying Insect, which is a project to make a uh, 100 milligram uh, autonomous uh, flying device. And he got pretty close while he was here, but then went to, yeah, <laughs> that's right. This guy here, this guy here said that would never work. <laughs> I remember that, we should record that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Rob, Rob went to went to Harvard uh, 2007, got takeoff, and uh, 2011 th uh, the fl a fly flying called the RoboBee project now flying around uh, uh, autonomously with with tether, doing really really great stuff. So Rob's won just about every award there is. Uh, the uh, oh, I got I got to refer to the the list here. So just Long list here, uh, DARPA Young Faculty Award, NSF Career Award, or now Young Investigator Award, Air Force Young Investigator Award, Technology Review TR-35, Presidential Early Career Award, and the Alan T. Waterman Award from NSF. So let's uh, give a warm welcome to Rob. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. And I'm sorry for the AV issues. I buy a new Apple, and this is what happens. Um, so uh, thanks. So, so it's wonderful to be back. It's been. 4,056 days since I left Berkeley, <laughs> and, and I, have, I have missed it every day since. It's a wonderful environment that you have, um, and, and in particular, I'm very grateful to Ron. One of the reasons that, uh, that I have such fond memories of Cal is because of his mentorship, so I'm very, very lucky to have Ron uh, AV in the faculty here. Okay, now on, on from the love. So um, I, I was trying to come up with a, a sort of a capsule to put around some of the work that we're doing. And so I thought of this, and this, uh, I apologize if this is going to offend anybody actually working in artificial intelligence. We don't work in artificial intelligence, um, but, but I, I sort of grabbed a, a definition and sort of uh, uh, altered it a little bit to my liking. Um, so theory of development in computer systems are robots that are able to perform perception, control, autonomy, and tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as perception, et cetera. So this is something that was coined back uh, about you know, 50, 60 years ago, um, and something that, that I'm sure many of you are, are, are working on here today. So that's not what we do. We do more of this. So our work, I, I, I would sort of describe as the mechanical side of artificial intelligence. So developing new platforms um, that make these challenges for perception control autonomy easier by virtue of their design or manufacturing materials, et cetera. Um, there's a number of names for this. I'm not, I'm not, don't claim sort of to have invented this. Uh, embodied intelligence, morphological computation, there's been a lot of people that have been working in these related areas. So AI is 50, 60, 70 years old, um, perhaps older. Um, I'm going to argue uh, maybe at the end that some of these concepts have appeared uh, over 250 years ago. So, so I'll come back to that later on. But I want to tell you, I, I'm, I'm not going to sort of go into this is going to be mostly a high-level talk uh, of some examples. I'm not going to go into some of the details of how we, we envision this. I'll try to do this through examples. And the three examples I'll try to give are, are the RoboBeast project that Ron was describing, um, and then two soft robotics work uh, projects. One is on deep sea manipulation using um, under-actuated soft robot hands, and then uh, more recently uh, uh, work uh, uh, on an entirely soft robot. So I'm going to jump right in, given the time. So. Um, First is this, this uh, RoboB project. So what we're trying to do is create uh, the robotic analogy of this. So this is a carpenter bee. And uh, we look at this and take a lot of inspiration, work with a lot of biologists over the years who in and of themselves have been fantastic engineers, as many of you know. Um, but we, we try to use these, these sorts of uh, examples, these sorts of maneuvers. Very simple looking maneuver, but we can ask questions about how are the wings moving? What do the wings look like? How are they generating vortex structures? How are they manipulating vortex structures? What are the musculature that's powering them? What are the, the thoracic mechanics? What are the metabolic processes that are powering flight? What are the sensors, sensor modalities, control architectures, et cetera? And so what this does is this, this forms a lot of very well posed questions, I think, that engineers can take and run with to try to come up with uh, hopefully creative and, and interesting solutions to this. So, so this is one example of, of a potential outcome of this. Uh, this is one of the visions. I'm not going to talk about the applications for these things, but you might imagine. I'll try to give a little bit of context for each of these three examples. You know, one might be assisted agriculture or, or using these things for disaster rescue, et cetera. But to begin with, uh, this was, I think, one of the last devices that I made at Berkeley in, in Ron's lab. Um, they called the micromechanical flying insect. Uh, and and this, this required us to think, if we, if we say, take that example of the, of the flying insect, um, what, are the, what are these questions? What, what questions sort of come up? And we sort of think about, think about this sequentially. The first one that came up, which I guess is fairly obvious, is how would you build it? 
And so the, the, one, of, uh, one of the things I spent a lot of my time here on is trying to come up with, um, with sort of these mesoscale manufacturing methods that I'll get back to in a moment. Another one which is kind of subtle here, which you can't really see is, okay, if you can build devices on this scale, uh, probably electromagnetic motors or more traditional sort of macroscopic actuators are going to be inappropriate. So how can you come up with alternatives? And so those are buried in there too. I won't talk too much about that. And then there's all sorts of interesting aspects of bio-inspired design we were working with. At the time, um, a guy named Michael Dickinson, who is, at, who is in, o, uh, who is in uh, I say OEB, who was in integrated biology here at the time, um, uh, who, who was one of the first people that actually discovered how insects fly and, and did a very uh, quantitative analysis on that. And so a lot of things are sort of embodied within this. Um, oh, and this is us. <laughs> I haven't aged at all, uh, at all <laughs> and no, 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 it's wrong. So, okay, so, so the first thing you can think about and, and much being at Berkeley, one of the one of the big influences that the, you can imagine that we had is from Professor Peister and and and, uh, and Roger Howe and others that are that are thinking about um, using uh, surface micro and bulk micro machine techniques to create these fantastically complicated structures using uh, pr techniques borrowed from integrated circuit processes. And so that's that has a lot, bunch of fantastic qual uh, qualities that would be very conducive to a lot of the things that we would want to do with these devices: micrometer scale features, parallelizability. Um, and, and this is sort of illustrated with a, with a bit of an outdated example. This is a, a, Texas, a Texas Instruments DLP projection system, which I realize that many of you in this room probably don't even know what that is. But, um, but nonetheless, th this is one suite of tools that we borrow from heavily in, in what I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, another one, though, uh, that, that we, we sort of borrow from but more take inspiration about what not to do is the sort of more macroscopic nuts and bolts approach to creating very complex machines. This is a, a Ducati internal combustion engine. I could argue that perhaps you don't want uh, to have thousands of irregularly shaped components underneath the microscope uh, assembling these complicated devices. Uh, now I'm going to contradict myself because that's what we started to do. Uh, this, this, I guess I'll say, is the old way. Um, and, and another word for this is the graduate, with stu graduate student with tweezers process, which is um, exactly what it looks like. It's very skill-based, uh, uh, very, very labor-intensive, takes a lot of time to, to, uh, to come up with the components uh, to assemble them. Um, and, and so that, that has an obvious bottlenecks in terms of the throughput that you can have, but it has more subtle um, ramifications in terms of, well, if each, if each of the individual devices is, you know, takes you a few weeks to build and they're extremely fragile uh, and you don't only build one at a time, um, then, then they're, they're, they're going to become precious and so you're not going to be able to really explore the rich design space that you would otherwise be able to do, um, uh, that you would hope, hope to be able to do with, uh, with other processes. And so we came up with, well, we took a step back and actually took uh, inspiration from, um, if, if I could uh, be, oh great, if I could be blasphemous is why I don't use PowerPoint. Um, took uh, inspiration from Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, who, who as I'm sure many of you know, had this wonderful speech back in the 50s called There's, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, where he prophesized um, micro factories, small robots making copies of small robots, um, the, the sort of uh, described the, the, the low cost of this approach uh, and how there was, there was lots to be explored at these small scales. And so we kind of took inspiration from that. And we also took inspiration from, at the time, from, uh, from, from my, my son's library, which consisted of a lot of pop-up books. And so we created this technique where, if, uh, and, and it's sort of illustrated here, and then I'll show you a couple of videos of this, where uh, if I wanted to create a structure like I was showing you before, where the individual pieces, you know, I want a wing over here and I want an actuator over here, um, how can I construct these? Well, th this process, what this process does is actually take all these and make uh, sort of quasi-two-dimensional laminated composite structures. Uh, it's almost analogous to a 3D printing process where I go layer by layer to create a, a device. But in this case, I'm not going layer by layer to create the full three-dimensional volume. I'm actually using folding to create the final device. This has a number of interesting aspects, uh, one of which is the fact that I can use an arbitrary combination of materials. You can use whatever materials you want. I can sort of um, have composites, metal, ceramics, polymers. It doesn't really matter. Uh, another thing is that the, the 2D um, uh, fabrication tools are inherently uh, sort of easier to do, or, or I should say more readily scalable than more macroscopic, say, four or five axis machining. And so that's where we, we borrow a lot of processes from bulk micromachining, um, deposition lithography from more MEMS-like techniques to build up these sort of th uh, um, uh, 2D composite structures. Uh, and furthermore, there's a bunch of other subtle things like you can, uh, you can create uh, arbitrarily complex devices at these, uh, these scales where all, all the articulation here is based on flexure-based devices so we don't really have to fight friction as you might with, uh, with, with other types of uh, uh, bearing-like mechanisms, for example. 
Um, and we can pluck it out. We can sort of assemble the thing that you want and, and freeze the joints that we want, leave the, the, the other joints free, and then throw the, the, the rest away. So that's where we were a couple years ago. Um, this is what these things look like. We can make these things sort of in, in, in bulk. They, the, they become less precious. We can explore a very rich design space. Um, this one, I'll just I'll focus on this one for a second because I'll show some experiments in, in terms of control. So this is one instance where uh, this concept of, of this sort of mechanical intelligence comes in. So what our biologist friends at the time told us was that you, if you want to fly in a sort of re pretty basic sense, uh, two wings, each wing has two degrees of freedom, which are these sort of flapping and, and sort of pa and rotation, rotational motions. And so we, we thought originally, well, that's two degrees of freedom, that's two actuators. You can plug in these two actuators and control the, the relative phase between the motions of the actuators, map that somehow through some transmi uh, transmission mechanism, and you get the desired motions. And, and so and that, that, while that was possible, it was mechanically complex, and the fact that I, I didn't tell you this yet, but you're running these things at, at, at resonance frequency of some mode in the system for efficiency, normally flapping mode, then uh, at resonance you're going to have some undesired coupling that's going to cause you to be sort of throwing away some energy uh, that, that you can't really do with, uh, with devices that are so power constrained. So uh, what, we, what we determined that we would do is actually have the flapping be commanded for resonance and then have passive rotation modes that if we dial in the resonant properties of these rotation modes, then we can have quasi-static rotation uh, to whatever sort of phase and, and sort of amplitudes that we want based upon moments of inertia and compliances of the, of the sort of flexure joints um, and aerodynamic moments. And so that worked out quite well. This is how we, uh, in a terrible, terrible graphic, uh, it wasn't supposed to look like that. This is roughly how we generate uh, motion. We fly sort of like a helicopter where we do amplitude modulation to generate uh, more or less thrust. Uh, we pitch the uh, wing strokes fore and aft with respect to the center of mass to generate what we call pitch. Um, we do amplitude mod modulation with bilateral asymmetry to do roll, and then we do this little bit more complicated thing where we create asymmetric drag to do, uh, to do what we call yaw. Um, we can also, um, again, apologies for the low quality of this, we can also do, um, uh, explore a very rich space of designs in, in these, given, given these manufacturing processes. So this is, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of what this is, um, this is a, a device which is trying to mimic to a little bit more granularity what the, um, what's happening in a dipter in a, in a fly's thorax. And there's some papers that we read that said, well, if you want to do effective saccades, they're called rapid turns that I'm sure you've all observed, um, then, then it's hypothesized that some flies uh, sort of do subtle manipulations on the angle of attack, uh, sort of time resolved throughout the stroke. And so this, what this does is take that same concept now and adds um, a, another set of control actuators that can actually do this manipulation. But I'm showing this to sort of give you a, a glimpse of the sorts, sorts of complexities that we can achieve with these small devices. And here's maybe a better perspective of this, this one, a, more, a more recent device. And if we zoom in, this just gives you an idea of the sort of complexities that we can achieve in these three-dimensional. This is, uh, I think it's uh, two um, parallel four bars, two spherical four bars, and two spherical five bars four actuators in, in, a, in a few cubic millimeters. So this is the types of things that we can create using these processes that give us the real freedom. Uh, one of the things that, I'm, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent here, but one of the things that this process gives us the ability to do is not sacrifice the physical complexity. And let's say physical complexity might be defined by the number of active or passive degrees of freedom in a device. As I go smaller, uh, our, our processes are more or less scale invariant, at least down to the sort of, to the, to the uh, dimensions of the, of the laminate layers. So, so we can create very complex mechanisms. Okay, uh, then we turn to questions of control, and so so this is this is actually um, a, a a fairly typical control architecture, and I'm going to come back to getting rid of that in a moment. Um, but the architecture is very simple. We have motion capture cameras, very sim similar to I'm sure what you've seen, sort of quadcopters flying around in. Um, and, and here's what this looks like in real life. Here's the actual device. So we're talking about not a room this size, but something about a volume of a few cubic feet. And then we can play around with. This, this sort of generic control architecture. And what we like about this is this gives us the ability to, again, tease out some of these, uh, both the mechanical design aspects of this uh, in terms of how we can make the control easier by adding these passive degrees of freedom, adding inertial structures, adding passive aerodynamic dampers, um, and simultaneously play around with different control architectures, different controllers. So what gets plugged into some of these boxes, for example, um, we've done things that are as simple as, uh, as PID, um, and that works out reasonably well. Um, 
Uh, more interestingly, we've done things with, uh, with adaptive controllers that uh, learn some of the unknown dynamics, which are many, uh, given the sort of complexity of these systems. Uh, we've also done things like, um, like sliding mode controllers or repetitive controllers to sort of eliminate the, the periodic disturbances that arise naturally due to these passive uh, flat, through these pass, uh, flapping wings, uh, but regardless, we can do this in a way uh, that is that that you, you wouldn't really, really really be able to do with larger larger vehicles. And the reason for that is quite simple. And I, I direct you to uh, Professor Fold for for a deeper discussion. But as you get smaller, you get more mechanically robust. And so we can fly these things around without care for crashing into things. And their kinetic energy is very small, so we don't care about getting hurt. Um, and so we fly these around with extremely aggressive. Uh, controllers and don't care about the health of the vehicle or the safety of anybody around, and so that's one. My, there are there are ex, there are extreme challenges to operating the, the scale, but this is sort of one set of benefits that we get. <coughs> okay, and then we plug them in, and and, and flight kind of looks like this, which is uh, this is a this is a, a couple years old now, but I'll, I'll get to more recent results in a moment. But this is sort of what happens, and and you know, uh, uh, sort of every every time as I as I uh, as you plug this in, note that this is uh, slowed down by a factor of eight. Um, and if you sort of look here, it's a little bit subtle. These are getting better and better and better. So this is a typical, I'm taking you through the a typical day in the life. What we do is after we build a device, we run through these, uh, through these sort of training tests uh, where we basically trim the device. This is in real time now, so it's, this happens very fast. <laughs> I think there might have been some aliasing there from the, but okay, but it's fast, okay. Um, and we like that. We, we, it's, it's very open loop, unstable. It requires us to really think about, again, the design of the things, um, but also the design of the control architecture as well. Um, now, if you do it right, if you do your control system well, um, then Kevin Ma and, and colleagues showed, Kevin, also a Berkeley grad, uh, showed um, uh, in a paper in Science a couple years ago that they could do successful hovering. Okay, so, so we're very excited about this result, um, and this opened the door to do a bunch of other stuff, which, for example, um, uh, we were able to do things like, um, uh, like perching. I'll, I'll give a couple of perching examples. Now, in this case, uh, this is, this is uh, using a technique called iterative learning control, so aggressive path planning using past trajectories to inform new trajectories for future trials. Again, leveraging the fact that this is trial, I think, eight, trials zero through seven uh, crashed right in, in, into the wall, right? And so, so, uh, so that's something that we can get away with, again, due to the robustness of these systems at small scales. Um, another more recent example uh, is this, where we were creating um, I, I had a student that was interested in applying, uh, in this case, an electroadhesive patch to try to, uh, not only sort of motivated by, again, uh, this concept of, of uh, I, I guess, loosely affiliated with this concept of this mechanical intelligence. So if I want to fly around for a, a sort of a long duration mission, um, the typical mode is, well, I got to think hard about my power uh, and have more batteries, et cetera. But that, that starts to get to be diminishing returns. Uh, more batteries means greater lifetime, but it also means greater weight, greater thrust, greater power consumption. So, so you have this sort of constant battle. His notion was, well, if you can fly around and perch on something, then you can extend your lifetime indefinitely. And so he created this electrostatic perch uh, patch and then showed that he can, um, showed that he can, using these devices, using these uh, patches, uh, he can go, he can fly around and, 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 and perch on um, more or less whatever surface that you wanted to, to perch on. Um, and uh, uh, this was done, this is, this is in real time. There's a couple of subtle things that are happening here too in terms of, well, how do we approach something without bouncing off? Well, there's some bio-inspired uh, um, uh, landing techniques that we, that we borrowed from uh, a guy named Serena Vassan in, in uh, Australia who studies bees landing and came up with very elegant um, uh, control laws that had to do with uh, if you linearly decrease angular, uh, your optical flow velocity field, then you get an exponentially decreasing approach velocity and you can land very gentle on things and show that bees do this. And so we try to mimic that as well. There's other more subtle things built into sort of passive damping structures that sort of soften the blow when the thing perches. Okay, so, uh, and, and, and there it is, great. Okay, so um, that's great. So now with each of these three examples, uh, at the end of these you're gonna be like, Okay, that's nice, but look, you got a tether connected to this thing. So, so what? So, so how are you going to deal with that? So, uh, so next steps. Uh, there's really a few things that are happening right now, um, which are the subject of a couple of PhD students who must uh, finish these in order to graduate. So, so uh, I, I am reasonably certain that they'll happen at least. At least I, don't, I don't know when, but. So anyways, one of the things that we work with is um, we're developing several classes of small-scale batteries 
This is work with Jennifer Lewis's group, who, is, who is, has some very interesting technologies where they can actually print um, uh, all of the components of a battery, um, anode, cathode, electrolyte, and capsulins, and make them at sort of arbitrary, size, uh, arbitrary sizes down to, let's say, millimeter sort of size. And then we're working with them to encapsulate that. We've got other uh, efforts in this space, too, but they're not nearly as interesting as what Jennifer is doing. Um, and then the other side of this is, uh, what are the electronics that are going on, on board? And this is sort of hark this harkens to what, um, what I was describing to you earlier. But so, okay, so, so what, is, what are the components that we need for this? So uh, the actuators, I didn't tell you about this, but they are highly capacitive, field-driven, relatively high voltages, 100 to 200 volts, let's say, uh, very low current. So the power is still in the order of, let's say, 100 milliwatts. But nonetheless, we still have to be able to boost what we're assuming is battery voltage <laughs> up to uh, the requisite uh, voltage for the piezos. And so, so we have... Uh, some, some collaborations with uh, a couple of VS, VLSI experts at Harvard um, developing custom integrated circuits to do power conditioning, custom magnetic components to, uh, to couple that. It's a tapped, in, um, in case you're interested, it's a tapped inductor boost, uh, uh, tapped inductor auto transformer uh, circuit topology, although there's several ways to do that. Um, and then, uh, so related is then you have to have uh, onboard control, of course. So you need some sort of onboard computation. The same group is developing um, custom integrated circuits to do accelerator-based computation. So basically think about this as, as taking a singular value decomposition of all the functions you might have of, uh, of one of these devices, processing optical flow, coordinating power, running a control loop, or even lower level stuff embodying those in sort of single function but high performance circuits and then having a, a generic uh, ARM based uh, uh, general purpose uh, computation unit to, to uh, complement that. This is where we, that's, that's sort of this architecture. Um, I won't get into the details of their accelerator based architecture, I'll just show you this as a teaser. This is where we are now. Um, we currently have this all packaged and, uh, uh, and hopefully soon we'll be do, uh, migrating this on board. The next version of the RoboB which is um, sized up slightly. This is now, instead of 80 milligrams, it's 250 milligrams, but has several hundred milligrams worth of payload, which will accommodate uh, what I just showed you. Okay. So, this being, this being behind time, I'm going to try to accelerate here. So, uh, the next of three examples I'm going to give you is a sort of dramatic departure. Uh, but I think that this one maybe embodies this concept of, of the sort of mechanical side of artificial intelligence better than, than, than the rest. And that's, this is motivated by the following. Um, we, we, uh, we're at, a, we're at a, um, uh, a National Geographic event where I met up with a marine biologist who was showing me videos like this. And, and this is exactly what it looks like. This is a, um, I don't know what depth this is at, but, but these things go down to full ocean depth, 6,000 6, meters, and, and try to um, uh, take samples of biological, uh, of, of, of um, delicate creatures like this, uh, like this echinoderm, for example. And, and they do it very poorly in this next video if it shows up here. This next video shows this even better. This is a glass sponge um, trying to be manipulated by this thing which is, looks like the jaws of life. And, and you can imagine that you, don't, that you don't get the results you want. You damage the organisms. Why do we want to do this in the first place, I should probably say, is that um, there's a lot of, uh, for, partially for discovery, um, there's a lot of very, very understudied organisms that, that live uh, either at the, uh, the ocean bottom, midwater, um, you know, benthic, uh, mesopelagic, whatever, uh, that, are, that are very hard to get at. They're very hard to collect. Um, so they're very understudied. Furthermore, which if you want to collect these things, you want to collect them on damage so that you get them in their sort of natural state. And, and if you do something like this to these things, they're going to start um, expressing genes which, which sort of show in a, in, a, in a stress state and not in their actual, uh, their actual state. And, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering all of this. But uh, nonetheless, we want to get these things up to the surface um, in their natural state so that we can do things like sequence them. Look at structure function relationships and I've got a, a biologist co collaborator on this project who's interested in looking at things like um, the, the function of uh, biofluorescence and bioluminescence in deep sea animals for example as, as, as uh, with applications into um, mammalian neurobiology and I'm, I, that's about as far as I should go because I, I don't want to butcher that more. Okay, but nonetheless we need to figure out how to do this. So at the same time, around the same time, we were developing things like this. So, so these, these devices which should be playing um, uh, we, we are able to take, um, to make soft actuators. And these, the, the, the examples on the left are, are several classes of soft actuators that are made in a very simple way. It's just an elastomeric structure, elastomeric balloon, that is, is fully soft, but then we start to stick inextensible materials within the device. And, and so what that do, does is, depending upon the arrangement of the fibers or the, or the sort of reinforcements, you can get twisting, bending, twisting, bending, twisting, coupling, extension, twisting, coupling, whatever you want. And so you can create these relatively complex motions by a very, very simple input. Now, um, if I wanted to go grab that, um, 
and I'll show more examples of this. If I wanted to sort of just go and grab that glass sponge, well, let me, let me come back to that because there's better examples than the glass sponge. But if I wanted to grab something using those sort of, sort of typical manipulators that I was showing you before, I can have all sorts of haptic feedback. I can have um, uh, you know, some very, very um, uh, precise impedance control on the sort of uh, manipulation, on the manipulator itself and on the control system. And this is teleoperated, which adds a little bit more complexity. Or in this case, what we do is uh, we ignore all of that, just do things open loop and, uh, and, and create things which are so soft that they're sort of impedance matched to that organism, to that structure, uh, such that they can't apply forces which would, which would damage them, or so we think. So we took this to field trials, which was something entirely new for me being, uh, being an engineer. Uh, we first took them on our first uh, uh, trial to, uh, to the Red Sea. This was the ROV. This is our co collaborator's ROV. Um, we had this, uh, it was a National Geographic sponsored uh, a dive, that's actually me, um, where, where, this is, sorry, that was a shameless plug, but, um, <laughs> where, but, uh, but we were able to bring these things down to the bottom of the Red Sea and do some uh, delicate sampling of, of, of specimens that, and bring them up to the surface of specimens <coughs> that either hadn't been looked at in, in you know, decades or, or had never, never really been seen in, 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 in real life. And so this, was, this, I think, is a very good example. So, so a lot of the, uh, the, the sort of coral, the uh, whip corals that we were seeing are these sort of elongated structures. You could imagine if I wanted to go do, a, a, you know, let's say a pinch grasp, or if I wanted to go even a power grasp, but, but the size of the palm, for example, is not really matched to to, to, this, uh, to this whip coral. Um, that, that would take a lot of, lot of, either a lot of skill from the operator, a lot, of, um, a lot of thought in terms of the sensing and feedback control for this. But instead, this is just a, a structure that creates a helix when I pressurize it. So I just go up near the thing and, and, and sort of turn the thing on, and I automatically get a nice power grasp. I can cut it and take, take a sample of this. This is another example of a different architecture, um, which was, uh, um, again, maybe that one's not the best example of a delicate grasp. This is, a, this is probably a better one. Um, okay, so this is, this is a little bit of a better one. Um, I don't know what species this is, but this was something where you can kind of give it a nice gentle hug, uh, cut, and then, and then bring it up to the surface. And um, so, so this was very exciting. We were very excited about this. It was it sort of proved the feasibility. The thing worked at depth. This is, I should mention, this is only about, let's say, 150 meters deep. So, so we're going beyond beyond the depth of scuba, at least not for technical divers, um, uh, but, but the goal is to get beyond the depth of scuba uh, such that you know, we, you, if, you're, if you're at scuba depth, you can just go down and, and collect these things by hand and your hands are, are, are pretty good at this. But beyond the depth uh, of scuba, um, uh, you're sort of out of luck. Uh, we did a second expedition uh, this summer. This was with uh, the Nautilus. And, uh, the Nautilus is uh, Bob Ballard's boat, the guy that discovered the Titanic. So we, we, got, um, we got some time on his boat and took these things down to, this is the, the sort of seat setup that we have. It's more of a modular setup in this case because we're not sort of ripping the hand off of an existing ROV manipulator. Instead, we are um, using an existing manipulator, which is highlighted here. Uh, that's, the, that's the sort of toolbox. That thing in, 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 in red here is the, is, the, is the manipulator I showed in a previous video. Um, and then the manipulator itself just grabs this, this sort of palm that has our soft hand on it. And we were able to do um, pretty good manipulation. I kind of wanted uh, to fast forward. Let me just fast forward this to, to the end here. Um, I can show you this more later if you're interested. But these are, um, this is now at 1,800 meters depth. And we're able to, again, without any sort of control, uh, just based upon the passive, soft, uh, passive compliance nature of, the, of, these, uh, of these digits, um, I pressurized, this case just pressurized with seawater, so it's a, a very simple interface to the existing infrastructure on the ROV. And then I can go and grab this poor uh, holothurian, which uh, I'm told, I, I don't know the biology of this, but I'm told if they get upset, uh, if a predator is attach, uh, attacking them, they sort of invert their stomachs. So that did not happen, so we assume that this is not uh, too pissed off. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so, so, that, so, so hopefully this, I think this one sort of gives, gives more sort of insight into the way that we think about this. It's a, it's a reasonably hard task. Go down and grab something, you know, go down and grab something from, you know, 2,000 meters deep in the ocean that has a 100 kilopascal characteristic modulus um, in a very odd shape uh, and bring it to the surface unharmed. So, so I think that's a reasonably hard task uh, that we can accomplish with a dollar's worth of components um, and, and, and sort of, you know, we've, well, uh, we, we had to bring, uh, you know, we brought a box of these things through customs in Israel. I can tell you a story about that later. That was not, that was not, particularly, that was not particularly fun. I gave that to my postdoc. 
Um, okay, so so okay, so now the last uh, few minutes, um, I'll, the last topic that I'll, I'll talk about is work, very very exciting work that we were doing with um, Jennifer Lewis's group again. Um, this is the sort of uh, obligatory um, motivational slides for soft robots. Anytime that anybody gives a talk on soft robots, they show a slide of, oct of, of, of an octopus. And so the reason is we're kind of this is kind of the envy of of what a soft robot might be is. Um, shape changing, color changing, uh, again, characteristic modulus on the order of 10 to, to 100 kilopascal, what is it? extremely soft, softer than your skin, able of effective locomotion manipulation, different gates even. And so this is something, I don't know what's happening to this diver, but this is, so that's something, these, these are sort of traits, not, not the attacking the diver, this is, these are sorts of traits that we might be interested in, um, in, in, in mimicking. And so um, we, we created this device, which we call the Octobot, and I'm going to just sort of take you through what this what this is and how it works, and then you're going to say you're not impressed. So, um, so, so, okay. So, just a, a brief survey of what's um, uh, of some previous work in the field. So, so there's a lot of people now. It's a, it's a relatively nascent uh, subfield of robotics, but, uh, but, but, but sort of huge interest. And, and the interest, um, I should, maybe I'll motivate this a little bit. The interest, at least to me, is as follows. Um, if I think about where the um, where the application space for uh, for robotics might lie, and, and and if I ask you to close your eyes, maybe it's maybe you're going to think of factory automation, big big precise powerful robots welding doors on cars, and and if you close your eyes, you're not you, you're going to envision the scene with no humans in it, and that's just because these things are are, are potentially dangerous. So what, what's the solution to this? Well, one solution might be, at least to me, would be to make the robots out of rubber, and, and then you can't possibly harm a human because you're more sort of impedance matched to the human. So there's a whole bunch of things. I'm not going to uh, suggest that we're going to replace industrial robots for factory automation. That's not the application space we're going to. We're going to more things that are in, in close contact with humans. So wearable devices, uh, biomedical devices, internal medicine, endoscopy, et cetera. So these are the types of things that we're interested in. OK, so that's the why. Um, so we, we, there's, there's a number of things. There's, there's people that have written uh, review papers on this now that I won't go through all of these. Um, so, but there's a lot of examples of things that jump, crawl, um, swim, uh, can manipulate things. And, and one of the pushes is to bring these things towards greater autonomy. So there's a few examples, and I'm just plucking off a few here, uh, partially selfishly, of, of soft robots, or at least mostly soft robots, that are, that are autonomous, meaning they have all their power systems and simple controllers um, on board. Um, but they're not entirely soft. So, so you have this sort of trade-off. The, the, the fingers that I showed you manipulating those, those underwater organisms, I would say the, at least the finger parts, they're entirely soft, although it, they're tethered for all of their power and control. In these cases, these are untethered devices, but they have these sort of hard, rigid, traditional controllers associated with them. So how can we get rid of this? So, so can we create entirely soft robots? Uh, the answer is yes. Okay, I'll skip that. Um, and so, how do, but how do we do this? So, how do we think about um, thinking about the breaking down a robot into a number of individual components: um, power, control, actuation, sensing, um, and then how do we build the things? And so, so we, we we started to look for options for for both power and control, and that's what I'm going to talk about first. So. Um, the, act, the robot that we're going to be that I'm going to be describing is a fluidically actuated robot. So, so it's powered by, in a very similar way as the fingers, uh, I increase fluid pressure relative to ambient, and I get some sort of deformations because the actu actuation is simple. But how do I generate that that fluid? In a previous example, which I didn't really point out, is uh, the the way that this was being done is either onboard compressors, onboard compressed gas. Um, in this case, what we're doing now is, is a monopropellant decomposition. So it's a, it's a hydrogen peroxide decomposition in the presence of a catalyst. So all you need is a liquid fuel, a small amount of catalyst, and then the, the reaction goes, well, the reaction's written down there. Basically, I get hot oxygen and water vapor, uh, hot water vapor, uh, and so I can get this at, at relatively high pressures. Okay, so that, that, that part is my sort of engine, my battery, if you will. I didn't tell you how we regulate this yet, but, that's, but I'll come back to that. And then the second piece of this is, if I want to then take this gas and distribute it to actuators and have the thing do something, then how do I do that without a traditional controller? Hopefully this will work. Okay, good. So um, how do I do that without a more traditional control structure? Usually what I'd have is, again, I'd have a, a battery controlling, a microcontroller controlling, um, con controlling uh, solenoid valves uh, that, that sort of let, let gas in and out or, or liquid in and out of these things. So instead what we did is we took inspiration from the microfluidics community who's been doing this for years, and I'll show you an example later on in the talk. 
um, of these uh, highly complex structures that you can make uh, entirely out of soft lithography uh, to make these microfluidic structures. And the really interesting thing to me is that um, you can make direct analogies of, of, ver of, of many um, electrical components, resistors, capacitors. You can make sequencers, uh, counters. You can make all, all sorts of really interesting devices purely in fluidic systems. And we didn't invent that. That's been going on for a while. Normally, this is done for things like um, high throughput cell sorting and that sort of thing and, and sort of benchtop things for microfluidics, um, lab on chip type things. We want to do it for robots now. The, as, a, as a sort of side note, this use of, um, of, of, of this sort of fluidic uh, equivalent of soft, uh, of, uh, of electrical systems, um, this has been also known for a while. This is, uh, I, I guess it had its heyday during uh, the Cold War when people were trying to figure out how to do um, uh, radiation hardened uh, control systems. And so this is, this is uh, a lot of literature was built up based on, on that. All right, so that's what we do, is we take uh, this, this sort of chemical uh, uh, energy storage, um, we pass it through this microfluidic control system. Uh, this is sort of shown diagrammatically here. So we have our fuel reservoirs passing through this, this uh, soft controller, which in this case is just a fluidic oscillator. So it's just a simple oscillator circuit that's going to distribute fuel to two different catalyst sites. The catalyst, at the catalyst sites, it breaks down into um, it breaks down into uh, oxygen and, and water vapor. Um, that pressure um, from these things also then feeds back and, and sort of pinches off one of the lines, creating the oscillation. And then vice versa happens as this thing is vented further down the line through the, actua uh, through the actuators. And this is sort of shown diagrammatically here in terms of how to create this oscillating pressure. Um, now, the next question you might have is, OK, that's interesting. How would you build this thing? Um, and so we wanted to do this as, as monolithically as possible, as sort of, as sort of a, a single piece uh, of, of elastomer as possible. And so this is work. Um, uh, Jennifer Lewis's group um, a, a few years ago developed this process called embedded 3D printing, where they take uh, a liquid reservoir of, of some uncured elastomer material. Um, and then the, uh, by getting the rheology right, which I'm not, uh, I'm not qualified to tell you about, basically they use shear thinning inks that, that they can inject within the matrix material, within this elastomeric material in its uncured state. They can do this with sacrificial inks. And then I'll show you in a second, but those sacrificial inks then are, are sort of frozen within the elastomeric structure. The elastomeric structure is cured. Then the, then the, the last little trick they figured out is you can auto-evacuate the, um, the, the what they call the fugitive ink, the sacrificial ink, out of the system, creating these voids. So I basically print, in, in, I, I'm kind of doing the inverse of 3D printing. I'm printing uh, channels in an in a, in a, in, in a, uh, elastomeric structure. The other thing which is kind of subtle here is, First, we create this microfluidic oscillator circuit using standard soft lithography and PDMS. Um, and then we sort of insert it into this mold. There's a bunch of tricks that I'm not telling you about, but I'd be happy to talk about later. And then print around it, print into the, into the channels of the um, fluidic oscillator down to the catalyst site, print a different ink to print catum, uh, uh, platinum catalyst, and then a different ink to, uh, to create these voids. Um, so when I'm done, I get, I get something that looks like this. Um, and this is, uh, this is sort of showing what the different components are, body matrix, uh, f a fuel reservoir, um, fugitive inks uh, uh, that, that make up these sort of channels, um, the catalyst site, catalytic ink, um, and then the control circuit as well. The, the, one of the tricks I mentioned is the auto evacuation of this fugitive ink. So this is just sort of a time snapshot over several days where you can't really see what's happening here because the sort of ind indices are, are, are almost matched. But as the, as the uh, it's a mostly water-based uh, fugitive ink. It's called a pleuronic material, which has a sort of inverse phase transition that goes from a solid to a liquid, goes to liquid water. The PDMS is permeable to water. It evacuates out, and I get these, I get these channels. The, the actual structure of these things, I have the, they have a, a huge range of freedom over just by controlling the, the rate of deposition, how, how quickly or, or slowly I deposit the fugitive ink creates different orifice sizes. And, and same thing with, with the catalyst sites. So. Um, then, then what happens? So then uh, I have this whole system together, and I, I plug this in. All, all that's happening here is I inject a fuel. I'm not showing that part. Inject a fuel. The elastomeric fuel reservoir actually creates a pressure in the fuel chamber, which sort of pushes the fuel to the system. And um, oops. Well, all right. Let me back up here. It pushes the fuel through the fuel through the through the system, and if you just sort of follow along the diagram here, causes this oscillation to happen. This is sped up quite a bit, okay, and it's basically just sitting there doing this. Okay. So, uh, what does this show? This is this is maybe the most extreme example that I have of taking of going this path of 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 sort of I'll say eight eight typical. Uh, robot control systems, atypical robot power and control systems, where I've got something which is basically a block of rubber, 
that I can inject a fuel in, that fuel gets distributed, catalyzed, passed downstream to actuators. The actuators then do something mildly interesting, and then it gets vented on and goes, and, and goes about its process. Um, I can say other interesting things. I can compare the energy density uh, of, of the fuel, for example, to the um, to, uh, capacity, typical capacities of the batteries, et cetera. So I could say all sorts of interesting things about this. But at the end of the day, you know, this was the first sort of standalone, we, we claim, this is the first sort of standalone um, uh, example of a soft robot that, was, that has no electronics, no rigid components, all soft materials. And we published that uh, in, in Nature last summer. Now, the, the, the natural thing you're going to say is, well, why the hell do you think that's a robot? Um, and so, and so I, would totally, I would totally agree with you. So this is, this is, not, this is not a robot in the classical sense. Um, uh, but but I, I, would, I, I would just sort of say this is more of a, a purely philosophical point. So are people familiar with this, this exa beautiful example of, of, of 18th century, I'll say engineering, but I'll say more, it's more artistic, um, of, of this. Uh, there's, and there's several exa examples of these things where I've got a, um, a mechanical device, in this case a, a, a little doll, that by, by virtue of, of, this was done by a Swiss watchmaker, uh, by virtue of this mechanical system can create these fantastically complex, you know, it can, it can write out simple passages. Uh, and there's a bunch of examples of these I encourage you to go, go, go look up. Um, now, uh, would you call this a robot? There's no wrong, I mean, you're not going to offend me. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, no. I mean, this is doing some prescribed motion. There's no feedback here. What if I said, what if I took, um, you know, that same pen, put it in a, a, a pinch, gra put it in a, 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 a jaw grasper, a parallel jaw grasper, put it on the end of a Baxter, and then programmed some, you know, did the, did the trajectory planning, did the, did the path planning, feedback control over the, over the uh, configuration space, et cetera, et cetera, did the typical robotics thing, and then had it sign its name. Would you call that a robot? I don't know. Okay, so, but the point is, uh, so I'm just trying to stir controversy. So the, the, what, what I'm trying to get at is that um, I think there's a really interesting um, opportunity here to take this very simple concept of this, this uh, trivial oscillator system. Um, this is, some, oh, this is terrible. Uh, this is something that out, of, out of Steve Quake's group from a while ago where they showed that they can have, you know, thousand by thousand arrays uh, of input-output systems that are doing, again, very complicated sequencing, uh, shift register, a whole bunch of stuff that they're doing in these fluidic systems. Um, you can also envision, we've got a lot of work in the past on uh, soft sensing systems. So you can imagine if I start to pinch off some of these lines, which I'm already doing here, then, then I might get some reactive behavior. So if I pinch off a line because I just ran into something, then that might be a sensor that feed back, feeds back into some part of the circuit. So that's kind of where we're going with that. Thinking, again, that's more of a philo philosophical exercise to try to think about, could we move these entirely soft systems towards something that more, more closely resembles a robot? Okay, um, just in two minutes, uh, just some, some highlights of a couple other things. I won't have time to tell you about this. Um, uh, and I don't know which of these videos are gonna play or what. So there's um, uh, we, we, uh, several other projects in the lab uh, for, for related to soft robots, for example, trying to create electrically activated soft, uh, uh, soft actuators, so, our, so muscle like soft actuators. We had some very, uh, very, we're very excited about some recent results where we had dielectrical elastomer actuators, which are typically prone to uh, very high voltages, uh, uh, sort of messy liquid phase electrodes to be sort of strain matched to the, to the capabilities of these devices. Um, and, and required pre-stretch, so one of my students eliminated all of those and showed that we can create these very thin films of, of high-performance muscle-like, uh, tens, tens of hertz sort of bandwidth uh, artificial muscles. Um, we've got a lot of work in, in soft sensing using, in this case, this is the upper, upper middle here, using um, liquid elastomer composites, so soft materials with uh, room temperature liquid metals uh, such that they're, they're deformable to the limits of the elastomeric matrix, which is, you know, 1,000% strain yet can do interesting measurements of, um, of, of shear pressure curvature just by the nature of the microchannels that are, uh, that are inside of them. Uh, I'm gonna start some of these over. Uh, we've done um, some, uh, in the upper right, some, some 3D printed soft robots. This is a combustion-based soft robot trying to get actually high speed back into these inherently slow systems. So we blow robots up. Um, uh, in the middle here, this is something that is, um, uh, that, that, that was, um, Using the concept of similar to how, what I was describing for RoboBees, making two-dimensional, three-dimensional structures out of two-dimensional structures, now this is actually folding itself from a flat sheet and walking away by virtue of, 
uh, uh, what we call shape memory composites, so materials that are in there, uh, in, the, in the composite which fold themselves. And so that was published in Science a couple, uh, a couple years ago. We can do terrible things to soft robots by virtue. These are silicone elastomer-based robots that uh, form a very strong oxide if you, if you light them on fire. And if you watch for a minute, you'll we'll, we'll run them over with a car and they still work. Uh, this is, uh, some, again, an example of assembly by folding using self-assembly. Uh, a couple of, of examples of, of legged uh, devices, which I don't have time to talk about. Uh, this is a new one, which I'm excited about. Um, where would you be able to use uh, the ability to make sort of millimeter scale devices with uh, embedded actuation, embedded sensing, embedded computation? Um, in hindsight, we, it's sort of obvious that biomedical devices, endoscopic and lap laparoscopic devices, uh, are, are one avenue for this. This is a bit old now, but we're, uh, we're slowly moving on to uh, more extensive trials of endoscopic tools uh, that give back dexterity to, uh, to, the, to the surgeon um, uh, for very complex uh, procedures, things like endoscopic submucosal dissection, so things like early stage uh, cancer removal in the gut. Uh, and there's a few other things which I forgot to put on here. Um, a program in echinoderm-inspired soft robots. Uh, we've got a program um, looking at ultra-fast motions in, in natural systems and, and robots, so impulsive systems. Um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting others, but uh, okay. So that's, that's this, and I'm gonna do a couple of plugs, so I apologize. Uh, one is for robotics at Harvard. Uh, a growing, uh, Harvard's engineering program is small, but it's a, it's a, a growing emphasis is on um, uh, uh, robotics. Uh, we have, uh, I'm not gonna list out all the faculty and in their, in their interests, but a lot of uh, translational uh, opportunities as well, and, I'll get, uh, and that's a good segue into the Wies Institute. Um, part of this thing called the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering, which um, is, is, a, is within Harvard and, and local schools, uh, MIT, teaching hospitals, Tufts, B, um, BU, uh, but has a translational focus. It doesn't really have an academic focus. The, the, the purpose of the Wies Institute is to take basic research results, apply business development and, um, and, and, and further, further engineering development to create uh, products, startups, licenses, or, or, or clinical translation. Um, and it's a highly, uh, highly uh, successful group um, that, I, that if you're interested in the more entrepreneurial side and interested in, in that path, I'd be happy to describe that to you. And lastly, thanks to my group members um, who, are, uh, who are the smart ones who are do all the work that I just showed. So I'm gonna stop there and do that. Um, what kind of sensors have you investigated uh, using on the RoboBees, either audio or uh, visual? Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. I, I didn't mention that. So um, we've investigated, um, uh, and, and this is sort of the, the use of this motion capture system sort of as training wheels, so we can plug in different sensors, different controllers, and, and sort of mix and match to see which works well. Um, to date, we've explored um, IMUs, magnetometers, uh, proximity sensors, optical flow sensors, uh, a wind sensing antennae, um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few, but the, 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 the um, thing that is most promising that we are sort of settled on, at least for, for simple hovering, is a combination optical flow IMU sensor. What are the main advantages of going for a fully soft robot um, versus mostly soft and hard, say, computation? Uh, like even the octopus has a hard beak. Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, it's a great question. I don't know if I have a particularly satisfying answer to that. So uh, we, we wanted to do this demonstration because we wanted to see how far we could push the technologies associated with being entirely soft. So I think that's really the main answer. I think in any real system, you're right, you would have some sort of hybrid, uh, hybrid structure. Um, we're not going to, and I, I'm, hopefully I'm, I'm not overstepping here, so we're not going to be um, replacing CMOS anytime soon with fluidic systems, okay? So, so, so that likely any real world functional system would have a beak or whatever, would have a, a, a rigid component immersed in this, to the soft thing. We did a, a, a project that was really, so that, that combustion jumping thing, um, that was exploring that a little bit because at that point we sort of were resigned to, um, you know, the, the sort of business end of the thing was soft 
the jumping mechanism was soft, um, and that there's good reasons for doing that. But then the the electronics power, etc., were all were all rigid. And so one of the interesting questions there was just like the beak example, it doesn't go from rigid to soft. It does this with a, with a sort of graded modulus. And so we we did some quick studies and showed that actually. If you are stuck with rigid and soft, then that's kind of what you want to do is have that, that delicate transition. But yeah, that's, you're, you're right. That's probably uh, um, the, the, the optimum way to go for anything real. Last chance. All right, then let's thank our speaker again.